before we start this presentation, a couple of words about the speaker, about myself. So I'm more than 13 years in uh, IT, which is uh, five years working in a consulting. And I work together with Roman Kolachak, who is our host today. And I, I always tell this joke, and the reason why I stay maybe with Roman for the, such a long time body to body is because when I came to Sosa, he was on vacation, and there was the only computer left was unattended. So I was sat at his computer. Well, that was the policy at the time. Now we have laptops, other stuff issued immediately because we are 4,000 people company. At that time, it wasn't like that. Maybe I got some virus from Ankolachak and I'm still working with him <laughs> in Paris. <laughs> and um, I'm, for the more than two years, I'm doing a product management at SoftServe in the form of solution management, pure product management, technical product management, technical product management consulting and other related things. And uh, as Paul mentioned that the product manager is either in flight or on a meeting with a customer. So like a, I like flying so I spend more than like half of million kilometers in the air which is more than 25 trips to the United States and other stuff about myself. So if you want to talk with me more find me on uh, Facebook, LinkedIn and other sources. I'm more than happy to communicate with people because that's what people exist for. Uh, no? Okay. All right. Quick, straight and important question. Who works in outsourcing? Cheaper, okay. It's time to market. Good. Excellent. Good. You made that project. That's even closer to what I want to hear. <laughs> Very nice. Um, well, let's take a look on the main company that this, that this company that wants to outsource. It's a very, very, very high level map of the company, as it looks like. Very high level. There's no other, there's no finance, nothing, because we're not interested in that. We're not. It's a, we have strategic product management, which is like visionaries. We have vision. That's what Pavel was uh, uh, telling about. A vision, right? So you know what to do. You may know not how, but you know what. Um, and uh, you have sales and marketing. So they push everything to the market. They hunt. They sell. You have a technical product management layer, or you, you may name it differently, but they digest what strategic visionaries produce. It might be requirements management, business analyst, TPMs, uh, and other roles here. And of course, we have engineering. <coughs> engineering is doing what they have to do. They create the product. DevOps, operations, they all fall into engineering because it's all related to engineering, right? So question to the audience. What do you think the company would outsource? Uh, technical product and engineering. Okay. Anything they can do without risks and with product. Alright, will they outsource sales and marketing? Yeah. Yes. If yes. this is not, not, not the core function, they yeah. can. They may not outsource the engineering too, if that's their core product. Well, I mean... They may not. They may do everything in the house, which is. But yeah, they don't sell and marketing is a final product. But they can sell and marketing. They own uh, staff. They own uh, technical management. They engineer. And what about strategic part? Let's say never. They can do everything. Well, and never ever because if you start outsourcing, <laughs> strategic vision, it's a. Completely different type of cooperation. It's, it's a co-development, co-ownership, but it's not outsourcing. You know what's interesting is with sales and marketing? Uh, usually they'd like to outsource this, but not necessarily those vendors would like to take it for outsourcing. Because this is quite a painful thing. At Sopsu we had a couple interesting projects when the, our partners, clients were like going to us and like, We'd like to give you like marketing stuff to you to outsource, and we say ah, like uh, you know, and is there anything else we can help you with? Because really, this is extremely painful, and you never know what you're gonna get. And definitely, technical product management and engineer. Well, we already all there, so and this is the other part that can be outsourced. And uh, but <coughs> sorry. 
What happens if, if the organization, well, let's say, well, like Hewlett Packard, decides to outsource, right? So what do they have to, 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 to create? So what happens behind the scenes? Usually, usually, it's not that easy that they just well, can come to you and say, like, we need to, like, five Python developers. Well, that, that's, that's what you start seeing. But in fact, they are building their whole giant organization on their site to support the outsourcing. All right? So we have some in-house engineering organization. We have some product management direction. Again, I'm not depicting here other departments. They exist, but it's, they do not influence that much this whole stream here. So we have a director of engineering, and I know that for many of you, director of engineering is the main contact point, right? You report to. You have some outsourcing manager. I know that there's some, I don't know how about, how about other companies, but it's also sometimes we're gonna have people whose position is soft service manager, namely, literally, like written like that. Moreover, before you have user stories in Jira, somebody has to put them in there, which is product manager, business analyst, an enormous amount of other people, just to give you one thing, to give the fuel to power that team, right? And now the question is, is that what you want it to have? Because if you go to outsourcing, you name that one of the things that you wanna have a cost reduction. Okay, you have a cost reduction, but look how many, well, those people are not cheap, right? And wages in the United States for director of engineering can be like 120, 100, 120 at least thousand per year, which is very, very expensive. And same for outsourcing manager and same, uh, product managers are probably the most expensive people. And, and they change companies like crazy, so keeping them in one company is it's too complicated. So um, that's not an easy one. So what, what, what's then? So we, now we run in the situation when the outsourcing support cost is higher than you pay for the team. So you, you have to spend more resources for, on, your, in, on your internal team. I mean, those that powers that, that, that offshore team than actually uh, outsourcing team itself. And then you question yourself, is that what I wanted? <laughs> is that what I came for to this company? Is that really what I expected from outsourcing, really? And there's a huge trend now in the world called tired of outsourcing, really, because companies, especially if you go to Asia countries, they said, oh, it's like, I'm sick and tired managing those folks. Whatever I tell them, they do it wrong. And it's not only like people would think about, this is about India. Well, well, f believe me, if you go and, and read reviews about Ukrainian companies, uh, Polish, Slovakian, well, you'll find a lot of interesting stuff there and what people say. So people get tired. They want to switch to some new model and you can offer them this, what we call a solution approach, right? We can do this other way. Why don't, why, why can't we build this whole organization on our side? Well, I think that most, most people say like, well, thanks Cap, well, this should have been done like that. But there are challenges. Um, good example is, well, let's say, I hope you're all gonna have enough money to build the house near the lake. You, your business runs very well, and you decide, I'm gonna build a house near the lake. I already have the land. I have an idea in my mind, but, and I, I'm employing the architect, not the software architect. I'm never let those folks build a house. Those build a house. I'm employing like a real architect and workers and say, build me a house. And they ask like, what kind, what kind of house? Like, Fancy, stylish, nice, and convenient. That's it. Okay, good. Then, the question is, will you trust that person? Excuse me? Sorry, the quality attributes you give <laughs> Well, that's it, but it's like, well, that's how strategic people work. Well, you may say, like, I want to jump from a house, like, like walk, 
uh, and jump to the lake. That's the like, feature. That's what I want. Or maybe some other crazy stuff. I want a helicopter pad. Well, even I, I would never have a helicopter, but it's going to be there. But it's like very generic. So you don't say, you don't speak about the, how you want to organize your electricity supply, how many wall sockets you're going to have on your walls, windows, other stuff. You want to have fancy, nice, cool house. You outsource this because you can actually take all those wood logs and other stuff, uh, jigsaws, and, and, and make it yourself. Well, you, you, may, you can actually employ the team of, of workers and work with them. Would be the perfect because what they do and uh, is what you do, and basically you get exactly what you need. But you decided to outsource this. Question is, um, what? When would you trust an architect to work in that way? When you just say your idea, and you would rely 100% that he will build the thing that will satisfy you. After the first result, which satisfies me, oh. when you heard With the record. well, after the first result, you're gonna burn it. <laughs> Actually, no. <laughs> Reference. Well, that's the closest uh, thing, but this one, one moment, when your tastes and vision matches. If I know the person who has the same taste in housing as I do, well, most likely I would, I would outsource to that person. If I see that the person is competent enough in building houses near the lake because that's what they are doing for a living, most likely I would go with that. So now question is because people ask me, tell me, ask me that outsourcing in uh, uh, product management in outsourcing isn't possible because uh, we don't know what, what client wants. We don't know what vision is. We don't, then we don't have a product management outsourcing. But if we do, we have it. <laughs> Again, it's a, all like thanks cap stuff, but. There's a very important thing. You have to get connected to product management team, strategic one, at client side. And now, you can only get connected to them if you speak the same language with them. Not only speaking about, we're not talking about German or English, but we speak about like same terminology, same ideas, and same product vision. They would connect to you if you know the market. They would connect uh, to you if you know the stakeholders, the competitors, and other things. And in fact, you can connect directly to executive management to report to them from an outsourcing organization. And we have those cases already. I will be talking about them later. So, and of course, this whole structure is more efficient and cheaper. And uh, they, it doesn't make people feel tired of outsourcing because they throw ideas on the table, you give them like a preliminary design, they say okay. Well, the other thing is, you may throw like design one by another, but if they don't like it, they will not work, they will not let you work in that model. So you have to be either successful from the first try or from the second try. Otherwise, you're not going to go any further. And it's a more, a way more effective model. Yes, Mark. Yeah. This model in the product manager is connected with product management team on client side. Then he's probably either hired or something he's reporting to head of uh, product management, head of product. Then what does he has to do with the vendors organization? Well, remember this um, this pre presentation delivered by Mohammed, mini CEO. Same thing. So you become somehow, uh, not only as a pure product manager, you also become, at software we now have this direction called solution manager. So you have enormous amount of services within your company. I hope you all have. And uh, you have access to them. It's not, that some, it's not that the guy from here comes to you and says, where are your three Java developers, seniors? for tomorrow. You decide you need them or not. If you don't need them, if you brought them because you need it, but you decided that you don't, you drop them. It's, it's, it all comes about, I'm not saying like specifically about developers because this is the like, resource management is responsibility for product, project manager. But 
you tell the project manager, you know what, we have to have a release by that, with this, this, and that feature. If five Java developers is what you need, then go and find them. But I mean, in that case, do you still work for SoftServe or for the client? I am the client at SoftServe site. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Taras. Uh, do, you, do you own the budget? I mean, uh, um, what, what are the KPIs? Because it, 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 now, if you decide whether it should be three Java developers, <coughs> seniors, or middle, middle, middle level, then you, in order to do this decision, you have to do budget, right? I understand the question, and the answer is, Yes, in most cases. I know the project budget I because I communicate not only to these people, but also, I didn't put that many errors, but I have connection to the sponsor. And the sponsor tells me, like, you have one million dollars, and this is what we expect for this. I can burn a whole million and create, okay, I can buy pizza for the whole company. Well, oh. And what if that if that will solve the problem of, of the client? No problem. Well, that's fine. But I'm deciding if I need. Do I need? Uh, and I'm working in a pair with project manager. Of course, it's a complementary pair. Do we need uh, six senior engineers or ten juniors and two intermediates? I don't know. Maybe so. The, Working with, but again, this is not the question that ultimately I'm focused in. I'm focused in on putting the right scope in right budget and creating this. Uh, I'm not well. I'm not going to say MVP in particular, but sufficient solution without the surplus perfection, because uh, as Mohammed said, perfection kills, and there's no limit for perfection. So th this is my goal. I see lots of questions coming. Uh, folks, by the way, um, <laughs> um, we're, we're doing good in, with, time, with the time, but uh, I really like your questions, and I know that they won't stop by, I don't know what time, but uh, if you can move on, please keep your questions, and we will have like open tables, we will have uh, breakout sessions, and we will have some time at the end of the presentation, but I really like answering your question because it starts igniting the stuff here. All right? Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, it's easy to draw a diagram, but it's not that easy to implement it. And <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it looks not as you expect this to be. So let's take a look on the journey that we did at SoftServe to get there. And the journey didn't start two years ago. It didn't start like five years ago. It started like way, way earlier. And we start to do one of the, our first projects that we did uh, uh, in the form of fixed cost, where we took the, first of all, only specifically engineering ownership. So, not that client tells us, this is what you have to use, use that framework, this, this specification, that, that it's like, <clears throat> we start to take ownership of the technical solution. When you release it, you have nothing, you have no single line of code, and you draw it from like, from the ground. <coughs> you, you prepare the architecture, and you, and you grow it. So, back in 2004, 2005, me and Roman Kolchak, we completed a very interesting project, a fixed cost one, fixed budget. So we had this budget, we knew, we control it. Now let's have a, some solution that will satisfy. And then we made it. So we learned a huge lesson of that. That first of all was like credibility that we can do it. We can do it. Uh, next huge project that came to SoftServe was in 2010 when we started working with Hewlett Packard. It was a security project when the Hewlett Packard set uh, come, came to us and just was like relatively tiny spec and was a simple word like go do it. And we made it in time and budget and we also took not only like this because in 2005 we had at least UI mockups in place right so here was nothing so we created we've been creating UI building it, uh, creating the deployment strategy, creating the release uh, packages. There's like different options, right? Like a, uh, S, M, L, XL, and other stuff. This is what also Mohammed was uh, um, talking about. So we were responsible for that. <coughs> Sorry. Then we start doing consulting. 
consulting, uh, you know, uh, when you start consulting other companies and how to do software development, specifically product development, uh, from a technical side, of course, uh, you start like feeling what pains uh, those companies they they have. They start feeling what the problems they have, and some you start correlating, and you find out there's ones the problems are the same. They only differ, only brands are different. And <coughs> finally, in 14 and 50, we start started to do uh, full product management and solution management for very quite famous uh, uh, players on the market. So you see, it's a like 10 years journey. And uh, I see people in the room here who've been with us and who are with us, who help us go there. So it wasn't like an easy one. Okay, Sp very specific case study. Uh, I'm not gonna name the company that we do this uh, just as, as, as a point of, you know, we have to keep some secrets. But the preconditions to the successful launch. Okay, I wanna work with the company in new, we call it new model, when I'm going to have product management, solution management on our side, and they will make all those, they play, play those mini CEO roles and so on. So it, it, sometimes it's hard to convince that you're able to do this. But so question to the audience, what are the preconditions you think that you can launch this successfully? Client has to be ready for that? Could be. Client has to be ready, definitely, because if they look on you as an outstaffing partner, well, it will be too complicated. But you have to be ready to take the responsibility. Awesome. Well, absolutely. Uh, you have to have enough expertise. Any other ideas? You should think in the same way as uh, your client. You should know uh, a lot of things about client, about client, about his uh, uh, area of, mm -hmm. of work. S SME. Well. When you start engaging with the company, the first thing that you have to, to do is actually you have to get access to strategic product management executives. Those, those visionaries, in other words. Because if you don't have access to the visionaries and you connect to, from the beginning, you connect to the engineering organization, well, you're just, you're just an extension of an engineering organization. You can, well, you can speak product management language with them, but they don't care. They do not operate with the product meanings like, uh, well, okay, they operate with scope because they implement it, but they are not in charge of its uh, forming, creation, and so on. So they don't uh, have all those functions because they don't need that. This is specific. You should have immediately an SME, a subject matter expert, on your site involved. Because if you don't have the person, the role, who is able to be very competent in the domain the client works in, there's no trust. Remember that this example was house. If you employ somebody who is very good in building office buildings, like cool like this, and he never built the house near the lake, but apparently this office looks cool. So maybe, maybe who knows, maybe he will be successful and maybe not, because they will build, build you a concrete foundation and giant enormous glass and concrete stuff <laughs> near the lake in the middle of green woods. So maybe you don't need this, so you don't trust this person. And uh, very important stage, and I know how many of you are being involved in the pre-sale stages? See, it's so very important that this product manager, the subject matter expert, is involved on the pre-sale stage when you start engaging. Not that in fact somebody comes, runs to the room, we have a deal, can you try product, product management here? I said, well, how, depends how you sold it. Ah, five Java developers, as usual. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, no way. I mean, okay, there is a way, but sometimes it doesn't pay off. Okay. <clears throat> So we start working in new model and we have a couple interesting problems that usually people comply being resolved. First of all, full engineering is at soft service. So you can really make a decision what technical solution you can apply. And thus, I know this is very important for people who work outsourcing here. You can easily staff people because if you decide what technology you're gonna pick up. You can take a look on the market, and if a Go developers 
are very expensive and you have plenty of Python developers, well, if it still can be implemented on Python, you better go there. Yes? But it, it, is, it is a slippy path, I believe, because uh, it is, you are acting not in the, in the best uh, interest of your customer, because probably he, has, uh, he doesn't have a, a belief that he will stay with software forever and he will want to, uh, to uh, hire own developers and for his market, the technology you selected is not the, the best choice. And, and, and this happens almost on every project. And that's, that's, that's a very good remark, that's a very good question. Um, well, well, here's the trick. You make a decision. So, so why we call this, why in product management there is a, maybe, maybe product manager is not mostly, mostly, is not responsible for like a, a technology selection, uh, but somehow he's in charge in, because it influences the product, especially if you speak about technical product manager, technical product manager, because it influences, it might, different things. <coughs> but um, uh, was, uh, so you, you, you have to convince, again, your customer, your partner, that this is the best way to do. And uh, sometimes they need just a solution. And we had the cases when they say, really we don't that care. We care about technology unless you use something I know, like very, very fancy. Uh, but if you use quite generic technologies, it's just a question like go with Java or .NET, uh, or something like that, or Python or Java or Python or Ruby. So they really don't care because in a month they will have to show something to their investors. Uh, if they force you to go with Scala and you don't have Scala developers, so they won't get anything. And Yes, uh, they force the thing they like, but in the fact they don't get it. And, and you sit in front and you say, okay, here's the backlog. I'm a, product, I'm a technical product manager. Uh, here's the architect near me sitting. So together we tell you that if you go with this on Python, you're going to have it in a month. If you go with this on Scala, well, good luck with that. <laughs> and that's it. So this is, it's a business. So, it's a, so you just give, give in options. It doesn't mean that you tell that I'm not going to do this. It's just you're given options, and if they say, okay, you know what? Okay, we can shift it for three months, but just find those scholars. Okay, let's do. But that's a very, you're right, so this is very, this is the, 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 this is the case when you have to maneuver quite well. That's why, as I said, the word management is, is in position title. Uh, second thing is approved cross-communication. Um, because usually we know that the problem is that uh, when the um, client starts talking to the development team about some product related or domain related things, they make those poker faces and it's like, they kind of are like, yeah, yeah, we understand. Any, any questions? Silence. Oh, no questions. It's like everything clear. And then when the, they uh, turn off the, the phone, what the hell is this? <laughs> Well, let's wait for the user stories. Okay, let's wait. So, uh, when the technical product manager, because of his commitment, because of his commitment where the product should go or not go, where we have the release in a week or in a three weeks, there's nothing, there's any more things like that. So, he, he's committed now and he, he handles this communication. And uh, with the customer, it's a totally different language with the customer. So, if I don't understand what they say, as a point of business domain, then I know what I'm doing there. And then I can translate this, I come to engineering team, because like Mohammed said, now I'm on the other side. I'm coming as a customer and explaining to them, but in a way, easy language, because of my technical background, what do they have to do, right? So this is a much better cross communication. So, and the third thing, uh, well, I didn't expect the third thing to appear, but it appeared somehow. You know, people like working more in the product companies than in outsourcing. And when they have this ability to choose the technology, to maneuver within the project, when they have a flexibility of these decisions they make, they were telling like, we feel like we're working in a product company. And they were really passionate of the things they do. 
So the employee satisfaction was very high. Sometimes not that high because they had to stay overnight. Then it decreases, by, by, but in the morning it, it goes back because they work for, like for the product company. <laughs> and well, no project with no issues. If no issues, then it's something might be wrong or we're doing nothing. So first of all, the first issue we encountered is a right stakeholders identification, which means that who is the main guy on the client side? Example, we work with the chief product manager and he tells you do, 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 do this, 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 this is my backlog, this is my vision. And he is or she is, in fact, on the project I'm, I'm not going to talk about, she is, she's the leader, she's in charge of everything. But here comes CIO and CIO says, we have to do intermediate release in six months. Uh, just because you cannot do 18 months project in the one pass. Even it's agile, we have iterations, we have, uh, but you know, there's iterations, uh, but said, I want to have some logically completed part in six months. And then we say, like, we go to back to the product owner and say, you know what, this guy told us to do this. He must be kidding. And so on. And then, and we have to follow this guy because, in fact, it happens that COO is the sponsor. And we have to follow product manager because product manager, she's, uh, she's the power. So, and if you don't pay attention in time, uh, whom to follow, or you don't clear this, you might be doomed because either of the parties, in, in, in either case, you will get something that it doesn't satisfy the other party. Not that many people know how to design and build the router or switch on a very low level. Some people say, I'm going to be a product manager, I'm going to be a product manager uh, for what project? A networking project. Okay, uh, can you draw me like seven layers OSI model and explain me what happens on the second layer? And where you have, uh, on which layers you have a redundancy stuff and so on. Is that what product manager is supposed to know? I want to manage. Well, okay, okay, fine, good. The other thing is the developers, uh, they think that, okay, user story have to, has to explain everything. But it won't explain you like very elementary, very basic things like that IP address, IPv4 is in fact 32 bits of information instead of the string that is separated with three dots. Sometimes you see this in database, still storing like that. So this is the, the huge problem and you, if you switch to the model when you want to have solution management, you will face it immediately. With that one project, this is the, what I call, satisfaction curve. So, <laughs> it all started quite well. Technical product management is involved in the pre-sale. It starts to develop. We show the initial mock-up, the product design. Client is happy because, oh my God, they're going to give a solution to us. They don't ask about like what to do. They don't ask about to, to draw the user. They just took this one-page document and they run it with it. This is awesome. We love you. Well, was the first milestone things uh, um, start change. Well, the case is, it's not only, remember, it's not only like your fault, it's always both parties. It's a too high expectations from the client and underestimation from software side and or vendor side. So first milestone fails. And amazingly, the second milestone fails because that's not easy. And the satisfaction does a very deep dive and it goes below the level when the client starts to think, oh gosh, I would better hire somebody else. I need to change the vendor. And uh, the case, why this happens? Well, I, would, I wouldn't surprise you, but it will always happen. <laughs> Only the question is how you manage this. You have, to be you have to be prepared for that and you have to prepare your client for that. So, uh, you, you would never have, well, if you have this, even more like exponential, something is wrong. Somebody is lying to you. It's always like that because this is the normal, this is, this is behavior of human psychology. Team was working hard, so we gained, we, start the, the, we started gaining knowledge. 
we start gaining the domain knowledge. Even like I was, uh, I have a master's degree and scientific degree in uh, telecommunications and networking. Uh, but, and this project was related deeply to the networking and security. Still, still was too complicated. And you cannot be like, you cannot play a role of every single, you cannot like take a piece of your brain and load it immediately in the developers. So you ha it takes time to share the knowledge. We were forced it was a time, the, 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 we were under extreme time pressure. The other thing that the client wasn't really understanding how the development works, software, even there was a software company and people with software background. And there's a, a very famous proverb saying like something, something and into production. This was like that. They thought like we're gonna, we're gonna do this and it's gonna immediate, immediately appear in production. That's what their expectation was. It wasn't like that in, in reality. With the third milestone, when the thing settled, this was extremely successful release. Well, finally we completed what we had to complete. And moreover, we started to be very proactive. We've been proactive since the beginning, but you know, um, the fails, they kill the proactivity. So you cannot be proactive if you have the depth of one and a half months things that you have to do, right? Because if you come to, you, to, the, to the client and say like, let's do this, okay, but you know, go and finish what you promised to do first. But now, um, it started to, 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 to recover, it started to go bad and better, and we switched to continuous delivery model, and it's successfully moving on. And that's all I have. Whew. So if you have any, any questions, we still have like, a, let's say three minutes, but remember we are cutting your lunch time. <laughs> Yes, Martin. Okay, uh, I want to continue this discussion, uh, this tricky, slippery road. So, if you're working for software, if you're reporting to product, strategic product management on the client side, and you see that the next task by strategic project ma product management um, actually sets, sets the stage that software is the best vendor in this. What do you do? Do you still work with software or you go find another vendor who's better in that technology or something? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the, that's the winning questions uh, for today, I guess. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, if I'm, if I'm on that other site and I see the vendor that is failing, there's like a, there's an emotional way and like a, really the professional way. Emotional way and on that diagram, the CEO of the company was strongly saying like, fire that vendor, fire software, we hate them. Uh, the CTO was saying no, because if you fire software, will be other vendor of same type. And we're gonna be stepping on the same problems again and again. Because there are things that are inevitable on your way that you do implementation. And, and you, you actually, this is the, your mechanism that you, as a vendor that you used to explain to me as a like, strategic product manager. Say, you say this, okay, we're not a perfect organization and the per organization, organization, there's no perfect organization. No limit for perfection, but this is what we passed. This somehow represents the learning curve, somehow. So we passed some learning we have the best talents, so if you want, you, have, you can interview them if you want to speak to them, because, but in fact they speak. So uh, we know what to do. It's the question that we manage the things in the wrong way. And management is all, always on the both sides. So my, I would counter challenge, uh, when, when I do a tr training on uh, professional behavior, counter, counter challenge is a bad behavior, but here I would use it. I would say, Will you find a vendor that is able to manage perfectly things? Be doing this in a bad way. Will you able to find a vendor who does this better? Will you able to do it better yourself, first of all, with the new vendor? And usually at that point, temperature calms down. People start talking more like, okay, how can we restructure that timeline? What can we do? Maybe we should shift something and so on. Maybe we should like reorganize the releases. And so. Other thing is, um, this happens 
if uh, the chief strategic product manager on this on the side of the company is not fully relying on what technical product manager is saying because if 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 technical tpm or product manager on the side of of the vendor says this release cannot be made any earlier than in two months and they say okay in a month we have a conference we have to present this i say oh you know what if you want to have this in this scope not earlier than two months and that's what i'm saying you as a product manager here technical product manager now we have to come to the conclusion if the if they don't listen and they force you to do deep dive and they will say change the vendor if you find the compromise then you will actually recover from the deep dive and start climbing back again I cannot answer your question on 100% because this is case by case and those cases appear every single day and you, day and you probably know that so we can talk about the particular cases maybe during the, uh, this, this lunchtime open table but well uh, professional ways is saying that be, being like true to yourself and the answer is no no answer to this question <laughs> Do we have time for more questions? Well, uh, one more. Okay, so uh, <coughs> the question is budget ownership. So if we have something outsourced, there is always conflict of interests. Uh, it's uh, um, client interest and outsourcing vendor interest to get some additional benefits from this engagement. And at this point, uh, maybe specifically in this case, maybe other cases that you could mention, uh, where, where is the balance? so that everybody is uh, actually happy with this engagement so that company outsourcing vendor gets enough money <laughs> and uh, the product uh, uh, company gets their product the balance is in the case that you don't deviate too much of the reality uh, like in this case if uh, you have you being forced to do unreal, unrealistic things just because you are the vendor and you can do everything it hurts every both parties I mean so if the reality is that you cannot do this in one month then this is the reality and you, you have to you know how you have to you have to tell the things as they are and you, you stand in and this is the, this is the, that tough most that this is that mini CEO stuff that you stand and you speak in front of the client saying like it's impossible I cannot arrange the backlog in the way that it can be built in a month. I spoke to my team, they cannot do that. Even if they, sometimes even they say, what if I bring you like 50K more, will you do this? You said, no, because this is the concurrency, this is, you have to be able to explain this. So th th that's the balance. And if we will speak about money engagement model, is it true that such model would work best with fixed bid projects or maybe uh, other uh, like paying models? Would well, you see, uh, Fixed bids, they are the, mo the easy ones, the easiest uh, as a point of money management because you, you have this already, you know the boundaries. But generally it will work in a model when you, you, you have, when, the, when the, like the core organization, this who is like requesting the services, is open for money talks with you. And it doesn't have, for example, in this case, we've been working in the TNM mode. Time and material. There's no fixed cost. There was no fixed cost. But we were telling them, like, this feature costs that many. This, this whole part of the backlog, if done in a way like that, this was my role as a technical partner. If you align this this way, it will cost you that amount of money. If you cut it and realign it, well, it's a non-linear system. It will cost you this. So I give them options, and uh, knowing the constraints, for example, they have conference, they have release, they have. Then we have. I say, okay, you decide. You make a final decision. But as a technical product manager, this is what I give you as an input. So that's that's um, that's how it's going to work. So it doesn't have to be fixed cost. It has to be. You have to be very very open for money talks. If you don't, no way. Okay, I think this is it. <laughs> Thank you.